Now, let me say this because I know that some people are like, oh, so does that mean once saved, forever saved? What it means is once paid, forever paid. Right? Once paid, forever paid. Now, you can choose to separate, separate yourself from the privilege that God has established because there is a condition for coming into that privilege. And what is the condition? Jesus himself speaking says in John 3, 16 that whosoever believes will not perish. So if you stop believing, you have negated the condition for salvation. So you cannot say because when you were in third grade, you believed the Lord Jesus and now you're a professing atheist. I have news for you. Jesus says, whosoever denies me before man, I will deny before my heavenly father. And that is at the gate of eternity. And you don't want to be denied because anybody who gets denied at the gate of eternity is being sent to destruction. The Bible says they will be sent to hell wherein their body and soul will be destroyed. Just like that. And that's it. It's over. You don't get to enjoy that eternal life. And so here is the deal. We know that the blood of Jesus is valid and we can be confident in it because God went through the process of having to put up with stinking animal blood for thousands of years just to make it very clear that when I say that this is what I want, it is what I want. And you can take it to the bank. So we see that if, if, if there's something else required, God would have asked for it. But he says, no, I just want blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. And Jesus already was slain even before we were made. The Bible says, behold the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the earth. So God already had the blood that he needed even before we came and before Adam sinned. But if we don't go through the process, there's no way we can have an appreciation for the power. And so... It applies to everything else. You know, sometimes if we haven't gone through lack, we don't appreciate divine providence. If we haven't gone through illnesses and infirmity, we do not appreciate the healer. And so a lot of what we go through, we go through in heaven's kindness and in God's mercy for us to develop a value system that allows for us to be functional citizen the moment eternity comes. Because we often get people asking this question, what is the point of human existence? What is the point of life? Why are we here? The simple answer is we are here to learn. And I don't even know why people ask that question. The wisest man in history by the name of Solomon already told us that. He says man was placed under the sun that he may be exercised and that he may understand how things add up. That was even where we extracted the word mathematics. From And so the man says, we are here to learn how to develop a value system so that when we get to eternity where things are infinite, we will not lose our minds. Imagine waking up one day and there is no more time as you know it, which means you can be in the shower for two hours and no one's going to yell at you. <laughs> you understand what I mean? You could just pinch your nose and then appear on another continent. Because there are no limitations. What would you do with yourself? But then because we have been here. And sometimes you know how difficult it is to get from A, from A to B. Especially if your car has been around for 27 years. And you know at any point in time it can just stop working. You will have appreciation for eternity when it comes. Because you, have, you know the value of what you now have in its infinite measure. And God wasn't going to let us be like Lucifer and the rest of those angels who fell with him because they were formed in eternity and they, they were just literally like spoiled children. They didn't know what they were throwing away, so to speak. Or maybe they did, but not the way we know it. Because we have come to experience these things as opposed to just knowing them by, uh, by what you call, uh, there, is, there is a term for it. Uh, we don't know the things we know anatomically. We know the things that we know experientially. You see, because you see those guys when they were made, every one of those spirits were made on the first day of creation. The moment God said, let there be light and there was light, it constitutes every one of those spirits. And so they showed up in an instant. And what, is, what do we have in scriptures? In Jubilees chapter 2 verse 2, it is said that even though they were made 
on that very first day of creation, they opened their eyes in consciousness and immediately started to applaud the God of creation. They were made and from day one, they knew what they were doing. But you saw how that ended up for some of them. But look at us. Look at all, all, all of what we go through. You and I both know some of the things that we have gone through just so that we can learn how to forgive. Some of us, you know what you have gone through so that you can learn how to be thankful for the mercy of God. You understand what I mean? We know the things that we'll go through to have an appreciation for what it means to be loved with an everlasting love. Because there was one time that boy told you that he loved you. And after six months, when you were expecting the wedding bells to ring, it was your ears that were ringing from bad news of a bad breakup. You understand what I mean? And so when you get to a place where God now loves you with an everlasting love, you will appreciate that because you have seen the, the, the torment of an aborted love. Okay, I think somebody can relate. You see what I mean? And so that's why we'll go through all of these things. Now, the other kind of works is the one Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Jesus speaking to his disciples and a cross-section of guys, he said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. These good works are not works that earn, that earn you a place in God or with God. These are the things that you do because you are already with God and you are in God. So that righteousness we cannot earn. But once we have received that righteousness as we have as a gift, what do we do? We now begin to exercise from the place of righteousness. Let me give you an example of such good works that Jesus commends very greatly. It's one of my favorite examples and it is forgiveness. You see what I mean? Because I have been forgiven. The Bible says the Lord removed my sin from me as far as the east is from the west. And so because I have received that, I have now become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because he forgave me. And so I should find it easy to forgive other people because no matter what they did to me, it cannot be compared to all of the things that I've done or that have the potential of doing. You know, because sometimes because somebody becomes evil before you doesn't make you more righteous than them. You just happen to be in the back of the queue concerning that particular infringement. And I can prove that to you. Last week, somebody cut in front of me in such a ridiculous way. And I got so angry. And I told my wife, why do people do this? He wouldn't even indicate. There was no indicator. He just cut in front of me. Literally, about two minutes later, I cut in front of somebody. <laughs> and my excuse was, well, I've learned from somebody else. I didn't, I didn't have that in me. That, that person made me do it. He wasn't. He saw the sea. Come on. You must know the person. Oh, yeah. Because that was too spot on. You know? But guess what? When he caught in front of me, I got angry. But when I caught in front of somebody else, I started to laugh. And I was laughing at myself because I knew my wife was going to say, wow. That didn't take long at all. You understand what I mean? Because if we think about it thoroughly, the Bible says God himself speaking he says, my spirit would not forever strive with man because he is indeed flesh and the thoughts of his heart are evil continually. So the fact that you have not perpetrated the same kind of evil that someone has done against you doesn't mean yours is not coming. But I'm not saying to anticipate it or to get there very quickly because there is also something to be said of that. Judas Iscariot, he had evil inside of him and Jesus told him what you must do, do quickly. Because Jesus was done with the suspense. If you're going to betray me, just do it right now. I don't even want to wait around anymore. You understand what I mean? So I'm not saying to adopt that mentality of, well, since pastor says there's evil in all of us, I'm just going to knock myself out, see if I can get it all out as quickly as possible. No, that's not what I'm saying. I am saying that there are things inside of you that you cannot even predict until you are faced with a particular situation or circumstance. The Bible says that the, the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? 
God is even saying even you cannot predict what you would do in certain situations and circumstances. Every single person in here has once said one thing or the other that they would never do. And now you've even lost count of how many times you've done it. You know, especially, you know, and you know how God works? God, the Bible says that, that God gives grace to the humble. God wants to give you grace, but you're not humble just yet. So he will allow an orchestration of events that will make you humble. Especially that thing you've said, oh, I will never do that. And then the moment you do it, the angel of the Lord is going to come and say, you were saying Oh, you understand what I mean? And that is the reason why the Bible says, let no one think of himself more highly than he ought to. The Bible says that, let him take heed who thinks he is standing, lest he falls. Because God never wants your confidence to be in anything that you can do to earn his righteousness. He wants you to be confident in his righteousness as a gift always, because it is that sense of gratitude that keeps us in line. Praise the Lord. You remember my, one of my favorite rhymes of all times is that an attitude of gratitude is what takes you to that altitude of beatitude. If you never heard that before, it's a good time to clap. That was a good one. <laughs> but the reality of it is, it is that sense of indebtedness, that sense of gratitude that allows for you to be able to extend love to another person. It is that sense of gratitude for the gift of God that allows for you to be confident in the face of opposition. Because if my righteousness was by my works, then I would always be at a, at, at a deficit whenever I'm faced with a situation that my works cannot remediate. Do you know there are times when you're in a difficult situation and you've done everything in the book and you've even written your own syllabus and you still cannot overcome the situation. Guess what you do in such times? You remind yourself that the most difficult thing is to get you translated from hell into his kingdom. And he's already done that. The Bible says God in his mercy has translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And so the same God who did that, he can deliver me from this one. Because knowing that you are not working to please him, but because you are pleasing unto him, you are now doing the good works because things that ordinarily would have been difficult for you to do, you now do it more freely simply because you know that it is not by your power, nor by your might. Do you know that some of us will never be generous if we're not confident that God will take care of us or that God takes care of us? The Bible says there is he that withholds more than he needs and he ends up in poverty. But the liberal soul shall be made fat. You see, once you've had an experience of the divine providence of God, then you will find it difficult to hold on to things. Simply because it's like, I'm not holding on to this because my life depends on it. If the Lord's created an avenue for me to be a blessing to somebody else with my time, with my resources, I will do it. And that is what constitutes good works. You know, because the church today or the 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 preaching world today keeps talking down on works by lumping the two different kinds of works together, telling people that, oh, it's not by power, not by mind, it's not of works, lest any man should boast, it is a free gift. And so they tell people, you don't have to worry about any works. And now that's why you see many believers who don't even believe that they have to do anything for anybody because it's like, why do I have to? I'm not trying to do that to impress God. I don't even need to do anything. His grace is enough for me. No, the Bible says that if you say you have faith, show me your faith by your works. I have faith, yes. And that faith is what allowed for me to engage the grace of God. For the Bible says that it is by grace that we have been saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. So how do I demonstrate that that faith has brought me salvation through grace, I demonstrate that by doing the good works, by allowing myself to be instrumental in the joy of another, by allowing myself to serve other people, by allowing myself to see to the collective progress of this new creation by the contribution that I make under the leading of the Holy Spirit. We need those good works. Having established that, let us now go back once again to this Matthew 15, 3. In fact, I want to show you something from 2 Timothy chapter 4. And it's going to help us to be able to embrace this Matthew 15, 3 better. 
2 Timothy chapter 4, we're going to read verse 6. Look at what it says. I'm just going to wait for you to get there because I want you to read it yourself. It says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. Verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul says, I'm empty. I've poured everything out. And because he poured everything out, he was able to declare that testimony that says, I have fought the good fight and I have finished the race. So basically, there is a race. And the race is not meant to be to outrun one another. It is not a competition. That race is to outlove and outserve one another. We're not trying to see who gets to the finish line first. We're trying to see who gets empty first. But what keeps us from living such dedicated lives is what Jesus pointed out in Matthew 15. He says, is it the traditions that you have adopted that have kept you from being able to live consistently this life of the kingdom. You know why? Because the tradition of man teaches us that whoever needs to get ahead may need to do whatever it takes, even if it includes slowing other people down. The tradition of man teaches us to look out for ourselves, get whatever you get, whatever you can, because if you don't, someone else is going to take it. They tell you that if, you are, if you're the nice guy, you finish last. But then at least you finish because those other guys who get to the finish line with wickedness have not finished because they haven't even gotten started because they have run not a good race but an evil race. You can only say that you are finished if you have fought a good fight. Dog eat dog is not a good fight. Pulling others down, others down so that I can rise is not a good fight. Let me tell you something. This particular generation in particular has been sold on this idea of do whatever you can to get ahead. And the way they present doing whatever you can is to get the most you can, is to save the most you can, is to avoid the most trouble that you can. Be a peacekeeper. Whereas the Bible says, Jesus himself speaking, he says, blessed are the peacemakers because they shall see God. A peacekeeper is the person that says, whenever myself and Anita have spoken for more than five minutes, we get into one argument. And so because of that, I will stop talking to her because I want to keep the peace. I want to keep my peace. It's one of the ways by which I show love to myself. Hashtag self-love. Self-love, self-preservation. But Jesus did not call us to be peacekeepers because peacekeepers are people who keep trying to put a cloak over that which needs to be exposed. So what do I do? I need to go before the Lord and seek the Lord. Why is it that we cannot talk for more than five minutes before it becomes an argument? What is going on? Because God has given me the commandment to follow peace with all humans and holiness without which no man shall see God. And whatever God commands you to do, he equips you to do. So that means for him to say that I need to be at peace with my neighbor, it means that he has equipped me. And so rather than trying to unveil the fault in her, I want to unveil the weapon that is within me that is capable of making that happen. I'm going to say that again. You see, many of us, we're too focused on exposing what is the problem with other people, whereas we need to focus on unearthing the tools that God has given to you and the treasures that are within you that are able to combat, deal with that, remediate, and move on in glory. So what do I do? I go to the Lord. When Job and his friends were arguing, they argued for days. Because when they saw what happened to Job, they came from afar. And from the way they were speaking, you could tell that some of them were like, oh my God, have you heard? Mr. Oh, I'm the wealthiest man in the, in the East. Look at him now. He doesn't even have a camel, not even one. Wow, we need to go and see. Because these people came from far away. 
The Bible listed the names of the places where they're from. Build that. Build that. It was a Shuite. There was another one that was a Naamathite. There was another one that was a Temanite. They came from different places just so that they can come and sympathize with Job. But when they came, were they really sympathizing with him or finding fault with him? Every single one of them, they kept saying to Job, they were like, God is good. This must be your fault. You must have done something. You don't have to tell us, but just admit it. They came to that conclusion. They said, we don't even have to know. Just admit to us that you must have done something bad because God is not evil. Look at all the evil things happening to you. You see what I mean? And Job was trying to explain himself, even in his sickness. He was trying to justify himself until he came to a point wherein he recognized that no progress was being made. And he lifted up his voice to God and he said to God, he says, by arguing, we have proven nothing. Oh yeah, that's Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuite, Zophar, the Naamathite. These people came from different places just so that they can say, ha, 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 we know stuff. I mean, look at us. We, don't have, we didn't have as much money as you, but we're still able to pay our bills. Look at you. You understand what I mean? But Job says, by arguing, we have proven nothing. Show each of us wherein we have gone wrong. And the Bible says that God sent them a man who brought the undiluted wisdom of God that allowed for them to recognize that it is the Lord's doing. And it was a mystery to them. And guess what happened? After the Lord revealed to them where they had gone wrong, what did he tell Job to do? God told Job to pray for his friends. And that was when he received his miracle. Praise the Lord. <laughs> God is good. After all of that, God says, pray for your friends. So he spent so much time trying to uncover the fault in his friends whilst his friends were doing the same to him, returning the ill favor, and no progress was made until he went to the Lord. And the Lord allowed for him to unveil the weapon that was on the inside of him, the tool that God, has given, given, that God had given to Job with which to win and reign in life was the tool of an intercessor. The only difference between the intercessor that he was in Job chapter 1 and the intercessor that he became at the end of his story was that in the beginning he was praying out of fear because he was always afraid that he would lose his children because they had so much wealth. He said it. It's there in the in scripture. He's, the Bible says Job will fast and pray for his children because he was afraid that in their heart they will curse God. He knew that they were spoiled children because he did the spoiling. And it was like, they may be too afraid to curse God in front of me because I, they, know, they know that I fear God. But he says, what if they curse God in their hearts? And that was when, when all the children were taken from him. He says, behold, that which I feared greatly had come to me. And that's why some people say, but God, why are you like this? I am praying and, and things seem to be getting worse. And God is like, yes, I'm doing you a favor. I'm exposing the kind of prayer you've been saying. You've been saying the prayer of fear. And that is the reason why I want you to get the result of what you've been praying for so that you know that prayer works. And if you know that it works, then pray the right kind of prayer, which is the prayer of faith that can heal the sick. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We need to know how to be consistent at doing the things that are expected of us. And one of those things Jesus pointed out was that certain things have become traditional, they become customary. This is what everybody does. When somebody fails, we need to first of all conclude that it must be their problem and we need to go and interrogate them and interview them. And by so doing, we miss an opportunity to bring heaven's intervention because we have become interrogators. Do you know this happens to couples? Whenever there's a disagreement in the home, the husband is convinced it must be what the wife said. And the wife is convinced it must be what the husband did. And instead of being helpers of each other's joy, they become what? They become bringers of allegations. The devil does not need you to do his job for him. The Bible says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. So let him do all the accusation. You do all the intercession. You do what Jesus does. The Bible says he forever lives to intercede for us. 
Jesus is always pleading for you and I. That's what the Bible says he's doing in heaven. He forever lives to make intercessions for the saints. Isn't it an interesting expression, making intercession for the saints? Wouldn't you have thought, well, they're saints. Why do they need intercession? Because for them to remain saints, they need help. You understand what I mean? Oh, yeah. The Bible says, John, I mean, Paul speaking to the Galatians. He said, oh, foolish Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Thinking that having been saved by grace, you will now be made perfect by works. He says, that's not how it works. If grace saved you, grace will have to keep you. And because grace is the essence of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you can see Jesus flowing like a stream, that is grace. The very essence of his being is called grace. The essence of the father is what? Is love. When you engage the father, what do you get? Love. Every time you cut the father, is God is love. That's what the Bible says. And that is why 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 14 says, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Father God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. If you cut God, it is love. If you engage Jesus, it is grace. And if you engage the Holy Spirit, it is sweet fellowship. And so when you look at it, Jesus needs to continue to pour out. Because if he doesn't pour out, there is no grace. And if there's no grace, sainthood ceases. Because we are not just saints once and for all. Again, remember, once paid, forever paid. But to stay saved, you need to stay connected to that grace. And to be connected to that grace, you need to remain a believer. You cannot deny the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the moment you deny him, you deny his grace. Let me tell you something. Jesus gave us an example of people who were believers. They were believers because Jesus admitted that they did miracles in his name. And you know, there's only one condition for doing miracles in Jesus' name. Jesus says, for as many as believe in my name, they will cast out devils. So to, to be able to do miracles in his name, miracles in his name, to cast out demons, I'm not talking about magic and sorcery. I'm not talking about people making it look like what it isn't, but I'm talking about genuine miracle. It can only come because you believe. And so those people came and they said, Jesus, uh, are you mistaken? We did miracles in your name. What were they saying? They were saying that we have proof that we believed in you. And Jesus was like, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, because I do not know you. Why? Because they denied him and they were just happy to keep, keep the gifts. If you want to keep, keep the gift without the giver, when it comes to the Lord Jesus, it's not going to happen. You need to stay believing. So if you know anybody who is preaching once saved, forever saved, help them to update their heavenly vocabulary by saying once paid, forever paid, but to stay saved, you need to stay believing. It is very simple, but people need to hear it. I know people who genuinely just want to know what the gospel or what the truth of the gospel is, but the false doctrines of demons that are out there is drowning so many people in complacency. Every single one of us needs to strive for consistency, and that consistency of execution is the key to ensure that we never become castaways. The Bible says whoever lays his hands on the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom. So therefore do not be one of them who turn back unto perdition repeatedly but be of those that press on unto the saving of their souls. And the way that you will press on is by making sure that you sever ties with any tradition that puts sentiment over love. To put an end to whatever tradition that puts the opinions of men over the instructions of God. We need to put the end what ever tradition that teaches us to be men pleasers rather than God pleasers. Because it is those things and Jesus called it out. He said, why do you transgress the commandment of God? Because of your tradition? Why do you keep falling for the same error? Why can't you just love? And we keep giving all kinds of excuses. I said, well, you know, if you don't teach people, no, people a lesson, they're not going to learn. You're not the Holy Spirit. The Bible says it is the Holy Spirit that convicts the world of sin and the believer of righteousness. If somebody needs to be convicted of whatever it is that they're doing wrong, I can just put in a word with the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, you see that woman, this is what I think she's missing. But what do I know? You are the Holy Spirit. And you just, you see, because it helps you 
To be, to, okay. <laughs> Let me come to this side. That was wisdom right there. She was like, hey, man of God, be careful. Because the Bible says that we are ensnared by the words of our mouth. You see, whether a man rises or he falls, it is by the tongue. And so let me be careful genuinely. So let's use another example. You see that your friend or your co-worker that you keep having issues with and you always want to point out the issue and say, this is what you're doing wrong. It is not your place. The Bible says, he that repeats a matter separates friends, but the one who conceals it seeks love. If you want love to grow, you need to learn how to conceal things. But you know why it is difficult for us sometimes to let things go? Because we keep investing. You understand what I mean? You find it more difficult to let go of what people have done because you keep investing. And you're investing what God has not asked you to invest. You keep investing all kinds of correction. You keep investing all kinds of rebuke and unwarranted or unsolicited whatever. Teachings and lessons. You see, because you keep wanting to correct people. You know, because if I don't correct them, they're not going to know. Who says that? You who know, how did you know? Is it not said in the word of God that there is nothing any man has that he has not received from above? So the fact that you know the right thing to do means you have received it from God. And if you're not seeing that manifest in the lives of other people, all you can do for them or what you should do for them is consult with God and say, God, this knowledge that you give me, that you gave me, let them have it too. I'm waiting now. You understand what I mean? Because by so doing, guess what happens? We allow ourselves to not stretch more than we should in the flesh and expand our strength in the spirit. Because your spiritual strength is inexhaustible, but your emotional tendencies have limitations. So let's learn to invest more in the spirit. But the tradition of men says, oh, you need to tell people. In fact, you know what scripture people used to support? Always wanting to correct people. They say that open rebuke is better than love that is carefully concealed. Yes, the Bible says open rebuke is better than love that is carefully concealed. But the Bible did not say forever rebuking. You understand what I mean? Because some of us, we have turned ourselves to the Holy Spirit in the lives of other people, always rebuking, 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 rebuking. Even God does not rebuke you all the time. God will rebuke you in a season and pamper you in the next. You understand what I mean? Because if he just rebukes you all the time, the Bible says who, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the Almighty. Who can handle the chastening of the Lord? Unless the Lord himself brings you mercy, how will you survive? Go and ask the fallen angels who have not obtained mercy. They will tell you how difficult it is to live only with God's judgment without his mercy. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, if you understand what it means, what it means, he was quoting from Hosea chapter 6 verse 6, that the Lord desires to show mercy over judgment. You will not keep bashing the guiltless. You know, sometimes we just want people to feel bad. We just want them, you need to know what you have done. Right? But you know, the knowledge of what one has done does not bring salvation. Adam and Eve, as soon as they ate the fruit, they knew what they had done. But did that bring salvation? No. What brings salvation? What brings salvation? Not the knowledge of what you've done, but the knowledge of what he's done. The knowledge of what he has done, the fact that he has given you the potential, the opportunity by his grace to be the best version of yourself is the hope that we all have. And whenever another is falling short in that area, let us extend mercy. Let us pray. Yes, let us rebuke every now and again. But we need to recognize that more than just openly rebuking the person, we need to secretly intercede for the person. Jesus says the good works that you do in secret, your heavenly father will reward in the open. So we need to break away from tradition. You see Genesis chapter 17 verse 3. Let us quickly... Go there and possibly even get ready to break bread. Um, okay, praise the Lord. 
I may share with us, I believe, up to four ways by which we'll break traditions that have kept us from keeping the commandment of love. Because the commandment Jesus was talking about is that great commandment that says love your neighbor as yourself, which he further expatiated on by saying love one another as I have loved you. And so look at Genesis chapter 17 verse 3. There is a name. Somebody say there is a name. Genesis chapter 17 verse 3 and look at what it says. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying. Let me say this folks. There are times wherein we feel desperate for the voice of God. We want to hear the voice of God. We're so desperate to hear the voice of God. But have you fallen on your face? I'm not talking about just kneeling down for two minutes. I'm not talking about texting Jesus a quick word of prayer. I'm talking about falling on your face. You see, the Lord brought this to me to remind us of the equipping we received before today. You know, a couple of weeks ago, maybe about a month and a half, the Lord brought me here two or three meetings back to back and I was speaking on the prayer of supplication, which means a humbled prayer. It is a prayer that is best described by what we have seen here. Fall on your face. You know what it means to fall on one's face? It means you're saying, Lord, if you want to walk over me, just do it. Whatever you want, I have reduced myself to nothing before you. I'm letting go of my ego. I'm letting go of my own, you know, because sometimes we have principles. And we're like, I, I'm not going to let anybody do that to me. The last time somebody did that to me, I made sure that I let them know that I am not that girl. You see? We, we all say things like that. No, no, nobody does that. Nobody, I mean, you, you hang up the phone on me while I'm talking to you. That's it. I'm not going to let you disrespect me like that. But let me tell you something. The Bible says God gives grace to the humble. If you will humble yourself before the Lord, not only will you win your brother back and win your sister back, you will also win a crown of glory. Because the Bible says that he that wins a soul is wise. I know the reason why I am doing what I am doing. Because the Lord commands it. And I know that when I do that which he commands, there is always a reward. I'm not going to let that person's bad behavior rob me of my reward. We have given power to too many people in our lives. The reason why you, go, you don't go to certain places is because you do not want to see a particular person. You know? They're like, hey, you want to go with us to the aquarium? No. The last time I was there, one face looked at me funny. But God has you on assignment to the aquarium because when he caught you, he called you a fisher of men. The same place that the enemy will put an obstruction to is the same place where God has assigned you to. The same place where the enemy places an obstruction at is where God has assigned you to. And Satan does that because he doesn't want you receiving your reward. You think Satan is happy to hear God say over you, Oh, this is my beloved son and whom I'm well pleased. And some of these obstructions can be justifiable. By our own traditions. When Jesus went to John to be baptized, John was like, this isn't right. You are the Messiah. What do I know? I mean, my work here is actually done because I'm only here to introduce you to the world and prepare you. So I am not baptizing you today. And Jesus says, no, you have to. That we may fulfill all righteousness. Jesus could have done what you and I would have done. When somebody gives us a commendation like that, we're like, oh, okay, so you recognize. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> no, Jesus was like, no, I'm not going to let you rob me of my father's validation. And he went through with it, breaking tradition. And guess what happens? The Bible says the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit alighted upon him and we heard the voice of the father. And do you know that that was the very first time that the father spoke to people in 400 years. 
oh yeah, from Malachi to Jesus was 400 years. And the Bible says in those days there was not a word from God. Gabriel came to fulfill prophecy. When Gabriel came to Zechariah, that was prophecy being fulfilled. When he came to Mary, that was prophecy being fulfilled. You see, but we didn't hear the father himself speak. 400 years, no word. The father broke his silence because Jesus broke tradition. If you and I will break our own traditions, if we will break the commitments that we have made, the exoskeleton that we put on to protect ourselves from hurt, if we will let it break, the Lord will give us the breakthrough that we need. We just need to take that bold step of trusting that the God Almighty who made us and who made others can bring out the best in them. So what do I do? I need to break traditions so that the Lord can break through. I want to encourage you today, folks, it begins with you falling on your face. Go before the Lord in all humility. Reduce yourself to nothing before the Lord. We read from James chapter 4 verse 10 on Saturday, didn't we? That the Lord will lift up the ones who are humble. I want to encourage you today. I'm going to tell you the three, maybe two or three other things very quickly. So that's one of them. You need to fall upon your face. If I let me tell you those things using scripture. Come with me to Psalms 133. We're going to read very quickly Psalms 133, verse 1 to 3. And maybe, maybe not even all of that. So Psalms 133. The Bible says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. One of the ways by which we'll break the traditions of men that keep us from doing the commandments of God is that we need to recognize that there are certain things that God has approved of, which means I need to go to any length possible. I need to go to every length possible to make that happen because that is the will of my father. Jesus says, what is keeping you from keeping the commandments of God? What? The traditions of men? This is how everybody does it? This is what's going on, especially in these Me Too movement days. In this, oh, everybody does this. Everybody needs to accept this and that. No, the Bible says this is what God approves of. For brethren to dwell together in unity. So whenever you are in a place and there is divisiveness and there is, there is um, what's the word? There is malice. There is angst. You need to be the one who puts out every fire that is contrary to love. You need to know it because if you don't know it, you can't be as committed to it as you should be. And the word of God is here providing guidance that it is important for us to have unity. It is extremely important for us to have unity. I'm going to show us another one very quickly from Psalms, the same book, Psalms chapter 7. Let's go to Psalms chapter 7 and it is Psalms 7. Verse 14. Let's go there real quick. Psalm 7, verse 14. Look at what it says. Behold, the wicked brings forth iniquity, yet he conceives trouble and brings forth falsehood. What does the wicked do? The wicked brings forth iniquity. The wicked brings forth what? Falsehood. Let's read that again. The Bible says, Behold, the wicked brings forth iniquity. Yes, he conceives trouble and brings forth falsehood. You want to keep the commandment of God? You want to love others? You want to be at peace as God commands that we should be at peace with all humans and holiness without which no man shall see God? You cannot afford to continue to bring out other people's iniquity. That is reserved for the wicked. And you cannot be planning evil in your heart. You know, there are times when somebody ate your sandwich that you put in the fridge at work. And you're like, okay, I got this. I got this. Even though the person apologized and said, oh, I'm sorry. It looks like my sandwich that I brought two days ago. They know because, I mean, they, they, they ate that sandwich. And they haven't forgotten that they ate it. But because they already conceived in their mind that they have an excuse, they ate yours. And you're like, oh, it's nothing. But in your heart, you know it's everything. 
And then you make that sandwich again and you put a whole can of salt in it. Let them come and have that sandwich again. That will be the last one they ever steal. The Bible says that's what the wicked does. The wicked is sitting down somewhere planning evil. Whenever you find yourself planning evil or planning to do something to punish somebody, snap out of it. That is wickedness. That is not good works. The Bible says think evil of no one. If you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, why should your heart continue to plot evil like the man who lived before the blood of the Lamb was made available at Calvary? We need to put away every guile from within us. Stop plotting to get back at people. It is not godly. The Bible says it is wicked. It is the tradition of men. It is what men do, tit for tat. You hurt me, I'll get you back. That's what people do. But Jesus says when they hurt you, guess what? Pray for them. Bless them. When someone strikes you on the left cheek, you turn the other one. You understand what I mean? That is what we do because the Bible says do not be overcome by evil, but you overcome evil with good. In modern translation, it says kill them with kindness. That's what we say, right? But how many times do we practice it? I'm not talking about fake kindness or just smiling, wearing in your heart, you're stabbing them with a knife. I'm talking about genuinely seek to do them good because only light can overcome darkness. Do not be the wicked. Do not think evil in your heart. Do not plan it. And then the last one, the Bible says, it is the wicked that brings forth falsehood. The next time you want to say something about your brother, to their face especially, the next time you want to say, oh, that is what... Kenyatta is always doing. Kenyatta, that's what you're always doing. You're always doing this. Ask yourself, does the word of God say that about him? Because if the word of God doesn't say that about him, then it's not true. Someone says, well, but what if he does that? Yeah, that is the darkness. The word of God is the light. Don't promote the darkness. Speak the truth. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 verse 4, let God be true and every man a liar. Stop saying, oh Kenyatta, that's what you're always doing. You're always taking people's um, tools and not returning them. No, but the Bible says it is the wicked that borrows and doesn't return. So if someone borrows your screwdriver and doesn't return it and you're calling them out, that is falsehood because God has already called them the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So instead of saying, oh, you never return my screwdriver whenever you take it, just say to him, you know what? I know you have the mind of Christ. Even though this hasn't happened, but I know it's going to start happening. You will always remember to return my stuff. Because that is faith. Faith is calling the things that be not as though they were so that they can be. You understand what I mean? So don't keep saying things to people like, oh, this is... No, because if you keep repeating their transgression, you are fulfilling everything the Bible says the wicked does, calling forth iniquity, planning evil. Because people plan exactly how they're going to deliver that thing to you so that you can really feel it. If we put that much effort into making people feel the love of God. And why, is, why are we doing this? You know, I told you a couple of weeks ago that the Lord is allowing for us to prepare for the power of the Holy Spirit. We started with the prayer of supplication and then we continued on forgiveness, learning how to forgive people, learning how not to hold on to things because when that day of God's power comes, we have to be in this. When that day comes, we have to be in one place and in one accord. And we cannot be in one accord, which is in unity, when we still have things against each other. The Lord wants us to break from the traditions of man so that we can be saved, we and our household. The very last one, I'm going to bring it out to us from, okay, that's it. Let's close. Let's break bread. Otherwise, we're going to be here for almost forever. So we're going to break bread today from Mark chapter 4. It's nice to take a break from breaking bread from the Old Testament, isn't it? Yeah. Mark chapter 4, verse 1. I think Alan remembered, I think two, two meetings ago, I talked about one time that I, I overread the Old Testament. I didn't balance my study. I just went full on and I became really legalistic. Yeah, even if when I saw people wearing a sweater that is knit out of two threads, two different threads, my spirit gets angry because the Bible says that you shall not combine threading when, you know, yeah, things like that used to make me really mad. And then after a while, you know, the Lord saw me through that phase and came out of it. Oh, yeah. 
I was so hard on other people that I was even harder on myself. You know, because what you have is what you give, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, Mark chapter 4 verse 1. We're going to read very quickly through 7. And then we're going to break bread. The Bible says, and again, he began to teach by the sea. And a great multitude was gathered to him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. Then he taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching, listen, behold, a sower went to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth and immediately it sprang up. But because it had no depth of earth, it withered away. But verse 6 says, but when the sun was up, it was scorched and it, and because it had no root, it withered away. Okay, so I kind of like read it even before I read it. Praise God. Verse 7. Now let me read 5 and 6 again, the way it is in the Bible. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched and because it had no root, it withered away. And verse 7, lastly, and some fell among thorns and the thorns grew and choked it and it yielded no crop. Let's do justice. Let's read 8. But the but other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and produced some 30, some 60, and some a hundredfold. And he said to them, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. As we break bread today, I'm going to share with you a principle very quickly. A lot of the things that the Lord has brought to us today are actually very heavy stuff. And as much as we want to relate everything that has been said to our carnal selves, your carnal experiences will benefit from it, but you're not supposed to apply that to your carnal self because you could set yourself up for resentment. And what I mean by that is you can begin to resent yourself, especially when some of those examples actually speak directly to you. So rather than feeling bad that you have exercised yourself in wickedness for so long and that you are falling short of practicing obedience consistently to the commandment of God to love without restrictions, without reservations. This is not about making you feel bad or you feeling somewhat. You need to apply these things to your spirit. The Bible says, let him who has an ear. Who has an ear? Not your flesh. You see, your flesh, even though you have these things out here, they're supposed to hear physical things. But the part of you that hears what the Spirit of the Lord is saying is your spirit. And so as you break bread today, ask the Lord for help. And say, Lord, let my spirit receive that which has been said today. The Bible says receive the implanted word of God with meekness because it is able to save your soul. What is the implanted word? The engrafted word. Why is God calling his word engrafted? Because what God is saying is different from what you are thinking. It's different from your own traditions. And so God is saying you need to engraft my word. Take a branch of my word, a branch, and cut off your traditions. Cut off your habits. Cut off your personality. Cut off the things that you have sustained from bad experiences. Cut it off and then replace it with this shoot of my word. That is what it means to engraft, to implant the word of God. The Bible says engraft it in all humility. Don't resist the word. Let it do its perfect, perfect work in you. And that is what will save your soul. And once, once your soul is revived, then you begin to see a restoration in your behavior, in your emotions, in your resolutions, in your ability to overcome opposition. And so I pray for you today in the mighty name of Jesus that as we partake of the Lord's body and drink of his blood and remembrance of him, we will receive grace 
to ingest these words into the good soil of our hearts. So that we're not just saying, oh, okay, I'm going to do better. And by, by Monday next week, we have reverted back to our old selves. I want you to receive the word of God into your spirit, man, today. Because your spirit has an ear for the things of God. So let him hear what the Holy Spirit has just said today. So that from here onwards, you will have consistency of execution when it comes to obeying the commandment of love and of unity and of peace and of holiness. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Karua Bakumze, Ibam Bakumze, Sheleba Bakumze, Kram Zai Bakumze, Bakums Ashiali Bakumze. The Lord is replacing pictures in people's minds. Some of us want to do better, but we're surrounded by images of distrust. We're surrounded by images of disappointment. We're surrounded by images of trauma. And that which we see in our heart continues to inform our actions and resolutions. Now the Lord is taking down the altars. The Lord is replacing those images. In fact, somebody here, not only is the Lord replacing the images, what I see is the Lord is taking you to a different window in your heart. He wants you to look out and see the trees blossom. He wants you to look out and see a new season. He wants you to look out and see a spring of life. The Lord is doing that with you today because in his mercy, he has chosen to save you even from yourself. So tap into the grace that is available today and say, Lord, that is me. I need all the help that I can get. I don't want to revert back to plotting evil. I don't want to keep going back to finding fault and iniquity in people. I don't want to be that one who keeps speaking that which your word hasn't said concerning people. I want to speak life. I want to bring joy. I want to be a peacemaker. I want to be one who pursues love and seeks to be, in, to be at peace and to live in unity. I want to be that person. Help me, Lord. If I can be that in my flesh, I would have been that since the day that I started school. But because I cannot of myself, I am relying on you to do it through the spirit that you have put on the inside of me. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give you an opportunity today to say, you know what? More than just receiving the communion, I want to receive afresh into my heart the love of God. Because I can only love as he loves if I have his love that never fails. If that is you tonight, you want to have a reconception. You want to reconceive the love of God in your heart. You want to have a fresh infilling of the love of God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that whenever we cut you in an offense, you only bleed love. I want to lay my hands on you today for the stirring up of that gift of righteousness make this between you and the Lord today and run up here quickly and let me pray with you because from here onwards you are experiencing the beginning of the rest of your life you're experiencing a fresh commitment to purity a fresh commitment to loving as you are loved and the Lord says it's going to be a quick work of righteousness so once you're ready I want you to just come forward Alan, you can come here real quick. Not this Alan, that Alan. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you for this is the day that you have made. I declare this man free to love. I declare him free to obey your commands. Another voice you will not obey. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and my sheep know my voice. And another they will not listen to. Any voice that is not of God, that cries from within you, that yells around you, that screams in your thoughts, that nag you to do the will of the flesh, I declare them silence today in the mighty name of Jesus. You will do the will of your heavenly father and you will bear fruits 
thirty fold, sixty fold, and a hundred fold shall you be a bear fruits of righteousness unto the Lord in holiness and purity of heart in the mighty name of Jesus. Son, you are free, for the Lord has set you free in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Alexis, I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, that the Lord will lift up your arm. The Bible says, lifting up the arms that are weak. I want Rosemary to lift up this hand. I want Alan to lift up this other hand. You can give me your bread. I hold it for you. I promise not to eat it. The Bible says, lifting up the arms that are weak. When Moses' hands became weak, they, had, they retrogressed in battle. And the Lord, by his wisdom, instructed them and imbued them with a strategy for victory. And this is the strategy. Lift up the arms that are weak. I declare you lifted. And once the arm of man recedes from you, the angels will take over. And your hands will be lifted. And you will have victory. Peace will reign in your heart. And all around you, even in your home, in the mighty name of Jesus. Daughter of Zion, it is a new day. And the Lord has come through and saved you again. He has come through and saved you again. Things that would have been regrettable, the Lord is like, no. You are not losing any more time. You are not losing any more grounds. I am taking you and strengthening your back so that you can stand and move forward. You know what is happening to you right now? And I declare that in the mighty name of Jesus, you will receive every ounce of it. The wisdom of God, the, the entourage of the Counsel of heaven go with you, giving you counsel every step of the way, present in every thought that you, Mrakedomo, Sila Mamanda Barosa, will operate in the instructions of righteousness all the days of your life. God bless you in Jesus' name. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in Jesus' name. Amen. Karamonda, see, Ki celebrodo shantolodori geda barababababababa. Fear leaves you not to return in the mighty name of Jesus. Lose her, you spirit of fear, in the mighty name of Jesus. And let peace fill and saturate her. Get me the oil before you leave where you're standing. We're going to anoint you with oil. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. Could you mind if I pray for diamond first of all? This is for you, love redefined. Love redefined, the one that you thought you had learned from, what it means, may not have done you a service, but the Lord has come today to do you good. Love redefined. You see, the way love is being defined to your heart right now is such that you can actually see the power to obey, the power to do, the power to sacrifice is actually in that love itself. It is self-sustaining. It is self-functioning. It, it is everything. The Bible says in him is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, even the man, Christ. And he's the embodiment of the love of God. And so you see, just wanting to love different is not going to be a chore because that desire for love is also the power to love. Karikum ziba. In the mighty name of Jesus, it's a new day. I declare over you also in the mighty name of Jesus an abundance of mercy, abundance of grace, abundance of understanding in the mighty name of Jesus. The ability to cast to let go and reach out. To let go and reach out. You know what that is. You let go and you reach out. In the mighty name of Jesus, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Josephine, anoint her with that oil in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of... Oh, no, not today. Just directly. Just pour it just on there. 
We used to apologize for messing people's hair up, but we're so thankful that we can actually mess your hair up or make your life better by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ because we do this in obedience. Life unto you in Jesus' name. I thank you. Where you desire to be with the Lord is exactly where God wants you to bring people and they will show you how. You see, where you desire to be, you see, the level of consistency with which you want to operate in the things of God is your divine assignment. That's what God wants you to do with others. And he will show you how to bring others to that place wherein they're not flip-flopping. Every taste for the things of the world that has plagued those people that God is bringing your way, the taste and the desire for the things of the world that keeps them from seeking the Lord wholeheartedly. When they come to you, they will lose that taste because a new tongue the Lord has given to you and you will begin after your own kind in the mighty name of Jesus. For kind begets kind. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Okay, so because some people just don't like to hear tongues without knowing what it means, I say to you in the mighty name of Jesus that the long-awaited rain falls now. In the mighty name of Jesus. And you know what it brings? It brings you ref a refreshing. It brings you a refreshing. You have to be mindful of oversleeping because that's how much peace you're about to have. In the mighty name of Jesus. It brings you a refreshing. In the mighty name of Jesus. I see you, woman. You have run and run and run. You see, I see you running and you got to a tree. You wanted to perch for a little bit and the tree dried up. And the sun still got you. And the Lord is saying that I am bringing my daughter to my well. You know, it is the promise of God that our sons will come from afar and our daughters will be nursed at our side. The Lord is nursing you at his own side. In the name of Jesus, drink up and be refreshed. In the name of Jesus, praise the Lord. Alrighty, God is good. A quick walk of righteousness. I'm hearing that again, so that means I need to be quick. Shannon. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, thank you. Because as this woman stands in here today, everything that she has conceived in her heart as what this new beginning will be, let it be refined against that which you have for her as the true new beginning that heaven has orchestrated for her. And Lord, the willingness to immediately let go of her own ideas and her own thoughts of how it will be and how it should be, that willingness, Lord, fill her with that willingness. In fact, you're taking that willingness from this altar with you today so you'll be willing to accept fully that which the Lord is unfolding. Even if it doesn't look exactly like what you have calibrated, you will be willing to let go and say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. This is your season of loving self as he has loved you and extending that love to others in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. God is good. All right, Sheila. You have come in through one door and now the Lord is leading you even through another. You're coming in deeper and you're getting closer. You're coming in deeper and you're getting in closer. So press in because there awaits you a room with all of the adornment that you need. Everything that beautifies your life is there. And once you walk into that room, you will be styled right. And not only would you look the part, but you will have the fragrance of that ambassador that you are. In the mighty name of Jesus, it is your season to flourish. Walk through that other door. It's not taking you out. It's taking you in even further. In the mighty name of Jesus, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Alrighty, God is good. Hallelujah. I know that word that came forth that they spoke to you. There were times within that message that I saw the gaze that was upon you as one whose soul is being opened to God for a refining. You see, this is not your attempt. So don't think uh, maybe it's just going to be like the previous ones. This is not your attempt. This is the Lord reaching out to you. And he brought you here today. Not one week earlier, not one week later. Because he has chosen this day to make it all beautiful. Your walk with him, the intimacy that you need to be that woman of valor, that woman of substance that you need to be, begins even now. It is not an accident, it is not a coincidence, but it is divine orchestration. Embrace the power of salvation the day that is available in the Lord Jesus. Tell him often that you love him. Thank him often that he loves you and let him know that he is Lord and you are willing to follow wherever he leads. I want you to say with your heart as you believe, Lord Jesus, not my will, but yours be done. This life is yours and I'm going to wait and see you bring gold out of it. He's bringing gold out of you, woman. Be trusting of him every step of the way. You have lost nothing. 
you have only been rid of things that are taking room in your life. So now you have plenty of room for the grace of God. So sorrow over nothing but rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice in the mighty name of Jesus. Say ko aib a is o paai mampum papai kwai. There is an ancient wisdom inside of you. There is wisdom inside of you that is beyond your years. The Bible says deep cause to deep. You see that conversation was for that wisdom on the inside of you. It is time to lead. That wisdom will lead you. Will guide you from evil. Every thought that brings you back in regret, I bring to submission today by the authority that is in the name of Jesus. Your thoughts will be forward looking and thanksgiving. In your thoughts you will thank God because he is good to you. Hallelujah. God is good. Praise the Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus. Great things are ahead. Run with zest to tomorrow because the Lord awaits you in glory. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Kenyatta, are you here too? Are you helping? Okay, God is good. Alrighty. Okay, when when then come, 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 come. Frado kunda yaleme kudosh ni yamalande gas krova kada mama gadalia boshte. The Lord says to lift up your face and behold Him. Your instructions are very clear. It doesn't seem like a language that you speak. It's okay. It's deep calling to deep. Your spirit is responding to that which the Lord is showing to you, and this act of obedience today brings you clarity, brings you enablement. You will just know what to do. It's going to feel different, but it is good. You will just know what to do. You see, I'm not talking about much deliberation or much research. I am talking about an express leading of the Lord. In this season, you will know what to do. In all things, you will just know. Because your heart has seen and heard. In the mighty name of Jesus, praise the Lord. God is good. First of all, I just want to say this because I don't want to forget, especially while we still have the room full. I am thankful to God for the heart of obedience that is here at Communion House. On Saturday, the Lord said for us to bring an offering, to make a commitment, to be a part of what God is doing materially, financially. And quite a number of people responded immediately. You see what I mean? Because normally I wouldn't go to look, but the Lord says, no, look and see. And so I'm glad that I looked and I saw. And if you were here or only watched it online and you haven't sought within yourself to make a commitment, do it today. Because there is, uh, there is, you see, God made it very clear. We need to show faithfulness in unrighteous mammon because a lot of what we anticipate that is of eternal value is tied to that. He that is unfaithful and unrighteous mammon, who will commit to him or her the true riches of the kingdom. Don't shortchange yourself because God is doing a new thing at Communion House. And you are plugging in and you know we don't do this. We had to break tradition on Saturday. You see, because we need a breakthrough. You remember that on Saturday I told you that I was breaking tradition. You see, let's break tradition and watch God break chains. In the mighty name of Jesus. So thank you. God bless you for your obedience. And for those people who are still pending. The Lord wants to quicken your step unto righteousness. That is his promise unto you. Do yourself a favor. Align yourself with the speed that the Lord brings to you. To obey without hesitation. To do without deliberation. And what I mean without deliberation is don't be there. Contemplating with the Lord. Let your heart yield to him in obedience. In Jesus name. Sister Natalie. You see the one that God gave to you. You give him thanks for it. Is giving you more. You understand what I mean? It's giving you more. It's time to add to your business another. You see? And you know how this thing works? It will be brought to you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, with the mighty name of Jesus, because this woman chooses today to have the love of God, the unconditional love of her heavenly Father, reinfused into her so that she can love others abundantly and love self accordingly. In the mighty name of Jesus. 
Makubs, on some days, it will seem hard because now your heart has decided to do certain things. And when your flesh wants to get in the way, that's when you feel like it's hard to do that thing. On that day, your spirit will prevail. The heart of obedience will prevail. The Lord said, just give her the heads up because she would decide, oh, I'm going to reach out to this person. You know, but on getting into that phone or getting into that door, it may feel really hard. But the Lord says, in that day, your spirit prevails. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. In the name of Jesus. I want you to pray for your friend, Bianca. Pray for her. Pray for her earnestly. Pray for her. And when the time comes, you will say, thank God I prayed for you. There will be victory. There will be avoidance. But enough evidence for there to be a testimony. But pray for her in the mighty name of Jesus. God is good. Can you please come? And... I know you can't wait to celebrate. I know your heart has been preparing to burst forth with a testimony. To burst forth. You see, you want to make such a boast in the Lord. And you will. David says, my soul shall make a boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. You see, it's a testimony that some people say, oh, that's wishful thinking. Things like that don't happen. But they will happen for you. Simply because the Lord is with you and they have to know it. You are not in doubt that the Lord is with you. You already know you're a believer. You see? And you have set in your heart to keep believing. God already knows where you stand when it comes to your confidence in him. But for the sake of those who are still skeptical, the Lord would allow for your light to shine in a very glorious way. Too good to be true to say, but it will happen to you, the stuff of fairy tales, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Don't be afraid to say, I am doing this because of the love of God. Yeah, it's you. Don't be afraid to say that this is because of the love of God. You're not saying that as a reproach or as a way of boasting, but you're just calling their attention so that they know that that which is being received that is undeserved, it is grace and it is the love of God. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this anointed one. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you because as his eyes continue to peak, through the curtains of the tabernacle, he will hear your voice from near the altar and he will respond, Father, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, as Samuel did and say, here I am, Lord, send me. Lord, I thank you because I know that earnestness, there is such a thirst and a hunger. I see you literally peeking over the curtains to see that which is going on in the inner courts. Now come close and see. In the mighty name of Jesus. You will love and she were loved by your heavenly father. In Jesus name. Amen. Alrighty. Praise the Lord. Rakomundo Shata. Father in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you. Because a mind that unravels mysteries. Have you given to this one. A mind that gravitates towards mysteries. Have you given to this one. And Lord when it comes to the matters of love. Beginning with loving you. And surrendering to your love. She will come to understand love. In such ways that people may not have considered and she will be able to teach them your love through these new ways that have somewhat been seen as others as mysteries, but she will break it down. She will make it clear. The Lord graces you today to live out the passion that you have for God uninhibited, unrestricted in the mighty name of Jesus. You see, I want you to encourage your younger one by your example. Encourage him by the instructions of righteousness, saying this is what I have seen in the word of God and this is what we must do. And just see how supernaturally he will be in agreement with you to be your partner in pursuing the Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. All righty, Sister Z, you mind if I pray for my brother Bradley first? Brother Brad. Right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, I begin to delete their voices from your mind. Every one of those voices that is not of God, I command them deleted from your mind. I want you to step away from him for a second. No, you stay there. Ministering spirits. 
take your place. Fortify this man. I see he's been delivered. That he will not be ripped apart or damaged. So as these voices leave, thank you. Thank you, thank you for you are here. So now you voices hear me now and hear me good. I come to you in the name of of the Lord of all spirits. I come to you in the name of the elect one who is the head of all principalities and powers. Yeshua, the anointed one. And I put an end to your operation in this man's life. The voice of another, it will no longer entertain. Any voice of confusion is silenced. You will hear clearly the voice of the Holy Spirit. Today you become Another man, the man that God is raising for signs and wonders. You are set free today from confusion. In the mighty name of Jesus, receive the abundance of light. Now hear the voice of counsel, even the voice of God's wisdom. In the mighty name of Jesus, I declare you free. No more room, any residue of the operations of the enemy as they have arrayed themselves against you and even against the ones before you. It doesn't matter how long they have operated. It doesn't matter how deep sea they think they have been. The blood of Jesus is against them and the name of Jesus reduces them to nothing and sweeps them out of your life today. And now be filled anew with peace and purity in the mighty name of Jesus. It's a new day. Praise the Lord. God is good. Sister Z. Hallelujah. You are free. And there we see it in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, just, you see, you only came out to fulfill our righteousness. God's done a fantastic work in you before you came in here today. So just give him praise. And you already know, you already know as he was revealing those things to you, he was exposing them because he's bringing you a bigger heart. Bringing out of you a bigger heart in the mighty name of Jesus. You don't have to fight anybody in the natural. You understand what I mean? You see, they will see the size of your heart. They will see the, you see, how mag, ma, 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 the magnitude of the love of God. They will see it and they will surrender to love. Love overcomes in the mighty name of Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. You see, do not resist them. They cannot resist you. They will submit to the love of God that is on the inside of you. I claim victory for you in the mighty name of Jesus, not in the courts of men, but in the courts of heaven. And now that will be done on earth as it is already done in heaven. That which is yours will not be deprived you. That which is yours will not be taken from you. The Lord has graced you and anybody who cannot stand it I just has to bow to it. Receive victory in the mighty name of Jesus. Receive victory in the mighty name of Jesus. Victory, 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 victory in the mighty name of Jesus. Anybody here in particular who says I need to be victorious of the people that I haven't prayed for, you come, please come. And I know that I prayed for you earlier and so in the mighty name of Jesus, I ask for there to be an acceleration of the opening up of your heart from your conscious to your subconscious. Let it all open to receive that which has already been declared by you because it was a prayer of faith and the prayer of faith is guaranteed to heal the sick. So let there be an opening up of every vessel and every cavity within you. All of your processing faculties, let them open up to receive the balm of Gilead. Let them open up to receive the healing that is already finished, that is already made perfect in the mighty name of Jesus. Hear and know that the Lord has already perfected all that concerns you. Let every cell in your body hear the voice of the Lord in Jesus' name. And then they will sing together in harmony the praises of the healer. My sister, Michelle, I want you to come close. I want you to come here if you can. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because... Every pillar of opposition that has been standing in the way, I declare them pulled down right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Broken all around you, but not to hurt you in any way, but you will see them broken. And it's now time for you to step upon the rubble, upon your high places, onto your high places. And so every delay, 
is terminated. I end the delay today in the mighty name of Jesus. And I declare for you to be called. They will call you. They will seek you out. They will call you to hand you blessings. They will call you to hand you blessings. And they will hand you some of those blessings with an apology. Because it's long overdue. In the mighty name of Jesus. So Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. This woman will continue to love joyfully, faithfully, as she always has. And her reward is guaranteed and her fruits will be multiplied. You see, you have always been a lover and it's time for you in this season to actually see more of the benefit of the love. Others will respond favorably to your love. They will not resent your love, neither resist your love, but they will respond favorably. It's time for you to have love to show for the love that you have given. In the mighty name of Jesus, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Alrighty, let's see if we can move quickly. Jordan. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God and in the mountain of his holiness. Let your heart sing a new theme unto the Lord. Let your heart break forth into singing before him. Let him hear your voice in adoration. Let him hear your voice in confidence. Let him hear and know that truly you esteem his name above all things. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you because... Can I speak this word over you? I speak over you a season. Of love. In the mighty name of Jesus. I speak over you a season of love. You will love what you do. And you will love the new that God brings. God will bring you a new thing. That you would love also. Father in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you because. With that love. Your daughter. Will become a woman of much dexterity. You see, the fact that the love for what you do and for the love for the new addition that you're about to do is of the Lord, you will find talents within you that you didn't even know you had because that love is empowering you and making you a woman of great dexterity in the mighty name of Jesus. But don't forget, let his name continually be esteemed in your heart. Sing his praises often, and that will bring you the radiance that you have missed. Sing his praises often in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. God is good. Sister Barbara. Alrighty. Okay. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because this woman responded today to the call to receive afresh into her heart the love that is unconditional. The love of her heavenly father. I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, not only will you love, but you will find new ways by the wisdom of God to communicate that love and to teach others that love in the mighty name of Jesus. Now I speak over you in the mighty name of Jesus, the kind of love that compels others. The kind of love that compels others, that grabs their attention to see the love of God. Those who have been avoiding, those who have been running away from, the love that radiates from within you will begin to compel them. You desired it. The Lord gives it to you today. You will be fruitful in the land of the living. Your light will shine and your good works will be seen in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let me pray for you two together. Hallelujah. It's time for you to have disciples. I know you desired it. You desire it. You're determined to see others benefit from the hand of God as the hand of God has kept you. But I speak over you that in the mighty name of Jesus, it will be done by the radiance of God's love that is going to be seen over you and in you. In the mighty name of Jesus. I speak it to you again, very clearly. It is time for you to raise others. It is time for you to beget others in the things of God, in the things of righteousness, in the things of sweet fellowship with the brethren and with the Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus. And I just want to thank God for the amazing things that he's doing in your lives, in your family, in your household. And I just thank God that more is to come and you will not be denied. You will not be delayed in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I give you praise because of the fulfillment of your word to them. With, and I thank God for the cheer with which they have received 
the move of your hand over their lives. Lord, they will continue to cheer you on as you work in them the glorious works of your kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy in the mighty name of Jesus. Chris, I pray to you, I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, they will see your light. You see, they will see your light. They will see your light. Gentiles will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your shining. It's time for you to receive the right kind of attention for the good works that you do. In the mighty name of Jesus, in every area, those good things that you have structured, that you have planned, that you have demonstrated, it is time for it to receive the right kind of attention. In the mighty name of Jesus, time for your light to shine. Time for your light to shine. Time for your light to shine. In the mighty name of Jesus, the Lord is allowing for you, Kayla, to be established where you're at right now, for you to have it as a foundation for where you need to be because it's not going to be much longer before you move to another level. But this level that you're in, you're consolidating. You're consolidating in communication. You're consolidating in authority, even in the marketplace. And from here, you're off to the races. You see, let me tell you something. People who don't see you for two years, when they hear about where you're at, by the end of the Lord, they'll be like, has it been that long since we last saw you? And then you will tell them, we're not long in time, but long in grace. In the name of Jesus. Father, be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Alrighty. Oh, wow, Patricia. Fear not, for I am with you. And you need to tell yourself that often. You see, because the love of God, the Bible says the love of God be made perfect in us. Cast away all fear. Because there is no fear in love. So be reminded of the love that your heavenly father has for you. Be reignited in your love for him. As Peter said, we love him because he first loved us. And now you see the fear disappear in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray for you today that you will experience the fanning of the wings of the angels of God's presence. The angels of the presence will be close to you enough for you to feel the flapping of their wings. And that breeze will refresh you will enlighten you and it will brighten your countenance in the mighty name of Jesus. And you know what that means? Let me just tell you what that means. The angels of the Lord are at work on your behalf, but you will begin to experience relief immediately. You will begin to experience relief in your soul even before it is all set in stone. You will receive relief in the mighty name of Jesus. Much needed relief, even tonight, you will begin to receive relief in Jesus' name. Some may not reach you for many days, but when they come, you will know that they have already happened long before the news of the relief reaches you. But it is happening. It is happening for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. Who else we got? Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Let me just quickly pray for Alan. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you because this man has seen the turnaround and now it will be that he will experience the fullness of the turnaround. You see, those things that you have seen, you're not just a seer. You are a benefactor of the grace of God. Mercy prevail. Mercy prevails. Mercy prevails. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, Emmanuel leader. I thank you, Karamandori Kidushte Father, because you have spoken over your daughter. You see, in the areas wherein you have experienced lack, it ends now. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, because that which continues, that has continued to rob your daughter has now been taken out. Father, I thank you because that with that wind, they go never to return. And now your daughter will see fruitfulness, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. It is a time for a relief to come. It is a time for a refreshing to come. In the mighty name of Jesus, you have toiled, you have labored, to press into the grace of God and now grace works for you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. Let the dreams return. Let there be an end to the drought of those clear pictures. Let, it, let there be a flooding of revelations in your sleep. And I'm not just talking about dreams, oh, little conversations here and there. I'm talking about express revelations. 
It is time for them to return. So how will they return? There needs to be peace and calm in your mind as you go to sleep in the name of Jesus. And they will return to you. I heard that cry, let them return. And they will return to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Peace be upon you. Papa, I thank God for you. We continue to give God thanks for you. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, this man's come here for a renewal of love. And I ask on his behalf specifically for the renewal of love for this life that you have given to him. Let his love for his assignment, for, for his purpose, for his existence, let that love be renewed. Let it be renewed with the a, with a right measure of passion to go with it. In the mighty name of Jesus, Father, that it will become apparent to others that this man is living the more than abundant life in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you. Let love be stirred up. Let love be stirred up. Where is Charles? Did you get prayed for? Oh, yeah, come, let me pray for you. In the mighty name of Jesus. While you're running, Anita, let me pray for you. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you. You know, I'm going to just say this. This is kind of like what from knowledge because I know certain things are unfolding and I just declare over you in the mighty name of Jesus that there will be a steady delivery of the things that have already begun until they are made perfect. In the meantime, I say to you in the name of Jesus, it is time to put on that robe. What I see is you have been you're ready to make a sacrifice. You're ready to do that which the Lord has commanded. And I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, that you will lay aside the robe of sacrifice and be ready to put on the robe of ceremony to celebrate as you receive that which you have petitioned of the Lord in his fullness in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Alrighty. Thank God for you, Charles. Earlier today, you came to my mind and I know for sure, I want you to grab this hand. Not that hand, the other one. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, I thank you because this man, you see what I heard is that it's already ready what you will do. It's already prepared. So just continue to enjoy where you are at and as soon as this ground ends, another begins. You won't have to jump. You will just have to take a step across. It is ready for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank God for communion house and thank God for the patience with which people remain in the presence of the Lord, knowing fully well that when the Lord is with us, we don't have to be elsewhere. The word of the Lord through the mouth of Solomon says, do not hurry from the presence of the Lord. Why stand in an evil place? You all have chosen to stand in a good place in the house of your father. And every word that you have received today, oh, thank you, uh, Sister Jordan, because I nearly forgot. I mean, I said Sister Jordan, Sister Williams that we need to do this. Did somebody take their communion already? Was that you, Alexis? I told somebody to take theirs. But you didn't do it. Okay, well, now you can do it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, and don't forget, this, as we break bread today, we're breaking bread from Mark, and this is about the good soil, okay? So this word and these great prophetic declarations, you receive them into the good soil of your heart and your spirit, that has an ear will hear what the Lord has said and will also do that which he has spoken in Jesus' name. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Alrighty. So um, while Alan is busy there, I'm just going to close out the service. And once again, I want to remind us... Um, we're going to be back here. Actually, let me just take a moment to bless the offering. Oh, sorry, I was going to take it home. Thank you. I'm going to bless the offering today with a verse of scripture. This verse of scripture, I don't even think you've heard me quote it or, or, or actually read from it in a, in a while, is Psalms 147. Let's go to Psalms 147. And this is just, uh, I'm doing this also because of the fact that I know that the Lord gave that instruction for us to take this time to make a special commitment to partner with the work that God is doing here at Communion House financially in a, in a different way. Psalms 147 verse 2. And look at what the Bible says here. The Bible says, the Lord builds up Jerusalem. He builds up Jerusalem. 
the Lord is the builder. And so when the Lord invites us to, to build with him, to make a contribution like he did in the wilderness, he asked the children of Israel to, build, to bring an offering to build the tabernacle. Their, their generations continue to enjoy that blessing. Because the Lord says, in blessing I will bless you. In multiplying I will multiply you. You cannot be in partnership with God and have a, and be at a loss. So the Lord says, I'm the one building communion house. I'm the one building Jerusalem. When we have an opportunity to partner with the Lord in building, what we're signing up for is by obedience, we're signing up to take our seat around the table of the partnership that God is inviting us to. You know, we don't typically emphasize offerings like this or take offerings like this, but in five years, we're doing it for the first time because the Lord says to break tradition. So I want you to connect with it as much as you can connect with this word. And I'm just going to give us a couple of moments to package our offering and then I will pray. Praise the Lord. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, thank you. Krabo Bokosh, me levelensi amon, do saflamo, mo jesho bla rabakas, me medala da rigida bosta. We thank you, Father, for the heart of obedience. We thank you because none of us will lose our reward. And as we have obeyed, Lord, we will eat the fruit of obedience by partaking of the good of the land. Express supernatural blessings. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise because you are with us always in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you because great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. You see, I don't know why this keeps coming to me, but Jordan, the Lord is saying, magnify the Lord. Sing hymns. Just tell him how awesome he is. To be honest, do it with all dedication. Who knows, maybe he wants to give you a song. Maybe he wants to give you a blog. Maybe he wants to give you something that would allow for other people to continue to magnify his name upon the earth, but it begins with you. Alrighty. God bless you all. Thank you all for coming out tonight, and I'll see you on Saturday by the grace of God.